Live from San Francisco, California, The Cube, covering Mark Logic World 2015. Brought to you by Mark Logic. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. Uh, we are here at Mark Logic World 2015. I'm John Furrier. My co-host, Jeff Kelly, uh, data analyst, big data analyst at Wikibon. Our next guest is Joe Pasqua, EVP of products at Mark Logic. Welcome back to theCUBE. Good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, products are everything now. So um, I love the product conversation because you're in a tough market of amazing challenges because you have real time, no SQL databases, <laughs> the cloud, agile, DevOps, enterprise software kind of all rolled into one. Right. So it's exciting from a product perspective. It absolutely But the pressure is. is pretty significant. So tell us, what's going on with you? Um, what's the pressure points for you guys? What are you guys rolling out? As, as new stuff, right. where's the roadmap? Lay it all out for us. So we just rolled out Mark Logic 8 uh, at the beginning of the year, and it's been, it's our best release ever, actually, and hits on a lot of the areas that, that you were just talking about. Uh, we're having a lot of conversations with developers these days, and that was a major, major emphasis for us in Mark Logic 8. We introduced lots of new features that were specifically targeted at the developer community, um, including our native JSON support and JavaScript support. And that's really opened up kind of a, a new model for how people approach development and a new set of conversations about how to approach the full stack. And people are kind of realizing now that all of the translations that they used to go through and all the steps, you know, from the browser layer to the middleware tier layer to the database tier, uh, all of that complication can start dissolving away because they can use the same technologies, the same data formats at every tier of their architecture. And that's kind of getting people to think in a new way. So let's unpack that a little bit. So you mentioned JSON, endpoints, and all that stuff. You're talking about you're putting data to, um, to work. That's developers have to engineer out, build out, that's mobile, that's web, right? Absolutely. And you mentioned full stack developers. So where is this coming together? Do I have to be a full stack developer to do all this work? I mean, one of the things that's coming out is abstraction. I mean, we just saw um, uh, an article we just posted on SiliconANGLE today about um, the, the research came out. There's more full stack developers emerging now than ever before. What is the trend in the developer community? And what does this mean? I mean, JSON, JavaScript, this is all about web development. Right. How does so, it relate to databases and as it relate to like middleware? It, it used to not <laughs> relate to them and that was the issue, right? If you were a, a web developer and you're trying to sell whatever it is, a, a service, a product uh, at the web tier, you were you know, sort of operating in your own world and then when you wanted to do anything with that data, you had to you know, change your mindset completely to go to the middleware tier. You know, you're doing stuff in Angular and JavaScript in the browser, and you're going to the middleware tier where it's all Java and enterprise Java Bean, so you have to go through a big mindset shift. And it was really hard to be a full stack developer because this, you know, every layer of the stack was completely different. And then you get to the database tier and you've got to start thinking about SQL and PL SQL. And it was really hard to even have the option to be a full stack developer. Now what you can do and what you can do with Mark Logic 8 is you can do JavaScript and JSON at the web tier and mobile just like you were talking about. And then instead of having to completely change your frame of mind, now you can take those same JSON objects, the same way of thinking about things with JavaScript, do that in the middleware tier with Express and Node.js, and now with Mark Logic, you, you don't have to change again. You can take the same JSON objects that you had all the way back out in your mobile tier and use that same JSON data right in yeah. the database, use the same programming model with JavaScript yeah. all the way down in the database. So basically everyone's a full stack developer, just call them developers, right? So Unless you're a UX guy, and then you have you know, great salary as well. Um, let me unpack that so, so kind of so I can tease out what it means. So what you're saying is, to, to translate is, if I'm a CIO or I'm a senior manager in IT or an enterprise, 
I got to hire developers, and my boss is banging me on the head saying, more top line revenue, get our apps mobile, cloud first, be agile, I don't want all this costs. So what you're talking about really is the perfect storm for that, right? You get the web tier, which means you can hire web developers and or quote, and edge of the network kind of right. UI guys or whatever. You have full stack capabilities unmatched before because it's all been simplified. Right. So that's perfect for the cloud developer. So if I wanted to say, I'm hiring cloud developers, that's kind of where it fits in? Or is it, it just enterprise in general? Enterprise in general, but more and more the enterprise is moving to the cloud. Um, and what, what it really enables is, you know, I don't have to be a full stack developer. Uh, I may not want to be a full stack developer. I may want to, to hire people with specific skills in specific areas. But what it does is it re re uh, reduces the friction between those tiers. So even if I've got a bunch of guys who do my middleware, and even if I've got a bunch of guys who do my database layer, they're not speaking completely different languages anymore. They don't yeah. have to invest in an entire area of technology that translates between the, the data and the languages at each tier. Mm -hmm. So even if they're different groups of people, it's much easier and much less friction to move between those tiers. And also the APIs are now a normal thing. Or people need APIs. Absolutely. You, you need to use, and also make them visual. We had Tableau on earlier, a big partner of yours. So APIs means cloud. It means <laughs> DevOps. So making it easier is a critical thing. Okay, so how do you guys relate to this? Because Gary Bloom was on earlier today talking about the goodness of your stack, talking about NoSQL is a gray, obviously the holy grail, making unstructured data available to be stored, acted upon, and implemented, operationalized, if you will. Operational. Transactional right. data. Uh, what does that mean for you guys from a technology perspective and to the customers? How do you build your products? What's the guiding principles? Um, share with the audience how you organize and how do you make it easy. <laughs> right, so, so we have a couple of sort of guiding principles that are fairly different from what you see in the rest of the NoSQL world. And APIs that you mentioned is, is a huge aspect of that. So the model that we have that's fairly different from what you see elsewhere is we fundamentally believe that the database ought to be able to provide data services. And so if I'm a, I was just with the customer last week and they're saying, you know, we're building this new platform and we want to be able to provide all these services and we, we, we don't want other people mucking around with the database. We want to control what's in the database, but we want to provide APIs to all of this. So their standard model is they'll do everything in a middleware tier and the other clients will come through the middleware tier and the middleware tier will talk to the database, very typical. And you can do that with MarkLogic, works great. But MarkLogic sort of fundamentally embraces the idea that there are data services that you want to be able to provide directly from the database. You don't want another tier involved. So we, we have the notion that you can move code, JavaScript code for example, directly into MarkLogic and that JavaScript code can publish APIs and it, it can have REST APIs. Everybody's doing REST APIs these days. You can put your own REST services in MarkLogic and publish those APIs out. And that's the key, because you don't want that tight coupling of those other services down to the details of what's in the database. You want to be able to publish out those services. You want everything to be API-based. Mm -hmm. You want those APIs to be delivered from the cloud, from on-premise, wherever you want them to be, and you don't want to have to care so about So what them. DevOps did for networking and infrastructure, you guys are doing for databases. That's, that's what we want to do. We really want to bring those worlds together. Call it um, DevDB. I mean DevOps. Well, or, I mean, if you if, look at our DBAs, um, they are much more of the mold of ops people than DBAs. That's mm -hmm. what they do fundamentally with Mark Logic. It's not like the the SQL world where DBA is the guy who's in there, who's you know tuning your queries, who's doing the reindexing. We have you know, about a factor of one to 10 in the number of people that it takes to operate MarkLogic, and those people are mostly ops-style people rather than DBA-style yeah, people. Yeah. And that's a challenge, because the DBAs, like storage, by the way, EMC's going through the same transformation. I see Jeremy Bird tonight at dinner, I'm going to bring it up with him, but like, you know, storage is kind of going away. Some say spinning disk is going to die before tape, where flash kind of comes in, which means faster data, faster information. So the old storage guys are like, stuck like this, and that population's shrinking down. We think the DBA, and even Gary said, you know, mainframe programs are still around, so 
I mean, I'm sure DBAs won't be ex extinct by no. any matter, but they're not going to be massively That's the right. huge population. So that being said, what is the new normal for skill set? Is it more SOA, service-oriented architectures, dashboarding, uh, Lego blocks, I mean, that's obviously the future we believe in, and I think you guys do too, but how does that play out in, in, in reality? What do you see specifically out there today, and how does that connect to the future? Well, I, I think Lego blocks goes right back to what we were talking about a second ago. The, the way those Lego blocks connect is through APIs, and, and that's what we're seeing you know, more and more and more organizations go to, is everything's got to be delivered through an API. That's kind of the, the fundamental tenet that, um, most organizations are moving to today. So rather than a model that says, you know, we're going to build some big monolithic application and if you want new functionality added to that application, it's much more we're going to build things on APIs and services. Yeah, there'll be an application on top of it, but you'll be able to do mashups as well. You'll be able to take bits, put them together with APIs and be much you more You mentioned agile. Semantic that you uh, did some research work in security. When I hear APIs, the first thing that jumps to my mind is Swiss cheese, no <laughs> perimeter, big holes. So when you move from a perimeter, Illumio, big, big startup funding today, only been around for a few years, $100 million in financing, um, ridiculous funding, amazing amount. Speaks volumes around the perimeter's gone, right? cloud. Right, so there's no more lock and key, no more front door. I need bodyguards on every single yes. asset. So the perimeter guys... perimeter is gone. It's the perimeter is absolutely gone, and and actually, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I think it's. I mean, it's obviously a real challenge from the security point of view, but the perimeter being gone means that you can start opening up services and and being much more agile than you ever had an opportunity to be in the past. But it does mean you have to completely rethink your security model. And, and of course, um, th you know, th that's key to what we do. We have security ingrained very deeply in the database, um, but you have to think about that at every so level. So you'd, you'd, you'd love if Dave Vellante was here, Jeff, because um, Dave asked Pat Gelsinger years ago at, at VMworld, is security a do-over? And he answered, this is 2011, I think it was still at EMC at the time, yes, because Pat's bold, he makes these bold predictions. Docker kind of bit him in the butt because he <laughs> predicted Docker. Ah, containers have been around for everywhere. <laughs> he changed his position on that. But he said, yes, security's a do-over. I would agree. So what makes the do-over work? I mean, we see database security at the cell level. You've got security now with virtualization. So the question is, what is the enabling technology that's going to enable a, perimeter, a perimeterless world so that a developer can be like, hey, I don't want to deal with scheme anymore. Thanks, Matt. Mark, uh, Mark Logic, now what, what's going on with, uh, with the app developer? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there is a technology that's going to sort of uniformly solve that problem in the same way that we thought the firewall solved that problem previously. I think what it's going to be is a uh, collection of techniques and approaches that are going to be applied at every layer of the architecture, and it's just not there uniformly today. There are some pieces of the system that tend to be much, they, they act much more like a firewall does. They really are you know, extremely restrictive, and they just kind of move the perimeter in a little bit. Um, there are other areas where, frankly, I, I don't think people have realized how exposed they are. Um, but I don't think there is a silver bullet that applies across all There's no all one those point ways. product, you're saying? No. So I it's going to be software, or some sort of scalable compute meets intelligent algorithmic operating system-like code? And, and, and you know, some of it is <laughs> going to be process. Uh, some yeah. of the biggest exposures are process exposures. Mm -hmm. And you know, people talk about, you know, we can't move to the cloud, it's not secure. Um, I, I would say that, you know, uh, there, there's good reasons for worrying about that, but at the same time, I would say, I, I would put up Amazon's security practices against just about anybody. You know, they're, they're very, very good. They do that for a living and their practices are great. And what I think some people don't realize is that it, it isn't just the technology piece. You know, you can have fantastic technology and fantastic security technology. You don't configure it correctly, you don't keep it up to date. Yeah. It's, it's worthless. So. <clears throat> Talk about, talk about how much you think about the cultural and process changes that are going to have to occur in your customers to take advantage of the product features that you're looking to build. As you are building out the product, <clears throat> how much do you think about, well, you know, this is going to require a sea change in terms of mindset for our customers to get the most value from feature XYZ. 
uh, is this the right time to do it? If it is, how do we enable adoption and how do we help move that mindset so that they can actually use it and take advantage of it? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Gary kind of alluded to it this morning in his keynote. Um, there's a really big spectrum right now. Some of our customers are absolutely living in the future. Mm -hmm. They are pushing us to uh, where they want to be in the conversations they're having about uh, the technologies they want to embrace. Uh, I was at a customer recently and they were all over this model of uh, full stack development and everything is an API. It is their culture. That's what they're doing. We're not pushing them, they're pushing us into the future. We've got other folks who are just at the point where they're saying, you know, I, I just have fundamental problems that I need to solve. I don't want to talk about changing anything else. I just want to get past the fact that I can't model my data. Help me with that, then we'll have those other conversations. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a, a really broad spectrum of discussions that we're having everywhere from, as I said, just, just help us over the, the problem, help us get to a, a schema agnostic model, to um, I really want to do everything in JavaScript, in JSON, in the server, publishing APIs out, and they're pulling us along. The, it's a bell curve, most people are in the middle of that, but we absolutely have folks on both ends of that spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk about your um, differentiation on the product side. Share with the folks out there, let's use the rest of the time to really share some of the key highlights on the product platform. Why are you guys winning? What's your big lever? Where's your real differentiator? I mean, I would argue and agree with you that you know, as you look at Amazon security practices, that at some point scale is a competitive advantage, which hints to the massive funding rounds for these early startups, not just late stage funding, but combined with the fact that if they don't scale up, they have no <laughs> differentiation. In open source, scale is a wonderful thing, but right. that aside, what are you guys doing from a product differentiation standpoint? What's your key, key jewels uh, uh, in the kingdom? There, there's three things from a philosoph product philosophy perspective that we always focus on. The first one is we won't do anything that compromises enterprise grade. So fundamentally the, the promise we make to our customers is you know, we'll keep running, we won't lose your data, uh, we're going to allow you to the operational flexibility that you've come to expect from, from the big players. That's key number one. Key number two is you're used to all of that HADR, all acid transactions from your traditional world. We're going to move you into a world that um, is agile, schema agnostic, moves quick, works across any of the platforms that we were talking about from cloud to, to uh, locally hosted. Um, so you're so an end-to-end -end platform. Schema-less? We are absolutely schema agnostic, uh, but we do that there are other people who are scheme agnostic, but we do it without giving up on the enterprise features. So those two are the things such that- Such as what? Um, such as the um, ACID transactions, the transactionality support, the uh, HA support, the flexible replication options, yeah. uh, all of those kind of enterprise grade uh, capabilities. And then the last thing that we add to the mix is what I was kind of alluding to before. Enterprise grade, got all the agility you expect, but then we've got the power features like semantics, like bi-temporal, like real-time alerting, all of that, all of the smarts that we actually put into the You bring the semantic the web to a developer environment in an unstructured data way, right? We do. I mean, that's we, really what I think you guys have, right? We, we do that and we can do it temporally as well. Yeah. Um, now in the enterprise, which is very difficult with all this other stuff kind of hanging around. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, semantics, you look at the industry standard query language for semantics, it doesn't have a security model. There yeah. is no security yeah, model true. in it. So when we put that in, we had to say, okay, well, that's great, but we've got to add a security model. We're not going to release it without security. It's all semantics, as they say. It's all um, semantics. So final question I had to ask you, because uh, Gary made a comment, I didn't have a chance to like, circle back with him, I want to ask you the question. Um, uh, he said a comment I want to just get your thoughts on real quickly, is that it's hard to add enterprise into the product as an afterthought. Okay, you probably heard him say that before, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't, yes. but I, you probably know what it means. Give me an example of, of what that means. What is adding enterprise to the product as an afterthought? He's obviously implying a, enterprise washing, but what specifically is he referring to? Bolting on security, is it other certain compliance features? What specifically, 
Uh, do you see other competitors and other vendors uh, adding after the fact that should be in the front end of the product roadmap? Well, I'll just mention two very quickly. The first one is um, acid transactions. The, the, the basic model of how you ingest data into the system, how you do it transactionally, how you do updates, that's, that's the core of the database. That is not something you, you layer on top. That's extremely hard to add after the fact. And the second one, again, coming from a security background, is security. If you try and add a security layer on top of an existing product, you are destined to fail. There's always holes. It's much, much harder to create yeah. a solid security solution after the fact than integrating it into the fabric of the product to begin with. Because if you're doing it after the fact, you're always looking for exceptions and things yeah. that are falling you're through. You're chasing your tail at that point. So, quick, give you the last word here. I know we're getting the hook multiple times, but I'd love to have you on. Love the product, pro have the product conversation. It's super fun for, for us. Um, what's coming up this year? What are you working on? Share us a little bit of insight if you can. Sure. You don't have to be specific. I know you might want to keep things confidential, but you know, directionally, what's happening? What's going around the corner for, yeah. for MarkLogic? So you think about what we did in Mark Logic 8 with the emphasis on the dev side. Mm -hmm. We're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on the ops side, right? We were talking about this. It's a DevOps world, right? So we're going to uh, continue to expand out our picture in the same kind of emphasis that we put into the dev world, we're going to put into the ops world and, and have a really complete DevOps model. So you can expect that coming from us. Uh, if I'm sure Gary brought this up, the vast majority of our customers today are using MarkLogic for the integration of heterogeneous data. Yeah. You can expect us to be doing more to make it simpler to get that heterogeneous data into MarkLogic yeah. and get the value out of it once it's there. Take that straight jacket off the, uh, the data. Absolutely. And free it up. Yep, yep. Okay, Joe, thanks so much for <laughs> <laughs> the time. We went, over, went a little over, I'm getting the hook here, but thanks so much for joining theCUBE. EVP of products here from Mark Logic, breaking it down, uh, great insight. Uh, extending the conversation, and obviously join the conversation, go to crowdchat.net slash MLW15. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with more live action, Silicon Valley at Mark Logic World 2015 after the short break. <laughs>